Last week, uh, Cedar Rapids, uh, Cedar Rapids community school district uh, closed schools one day because of threats made on social media. A 14-year-old student was actually uh, arrested and charged in a juvenile court with intimidation with a dangerous weapon. We don't know a whole lot about the case because the police haven't released a whole lot, so we don't know if there was an actual um, weapon involved or, or not. So uh, during this, during this, if, if uh, viewers have any questions, uh, please put those in the chat, and then we'll probably address those near the end of the session. I also want to thank our sponsor for this morning, ITC Midwest. So let me introduce the panelists, and I'm going to let them explain their connection to the session topic. Uh, we have D.T. McGee. He is the executive director of Iowa Association of School Boards. Hello, D.T. Hello. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me this morning. Sure. Do you want to explain your job a little bit, and you want to explain the association in case there are people that are not familiar with it? Sure. The Iowa Association of School Boards is a member organization. We represent uh, public school districts and their members, uh, their school board members, and then also area education agencies and community college boards and their board members. And so we have well over 2,000 individual members and uh, well over 300 uh, memberships from organizations. And so we provide legislative advocacy we provide uh, support for different board policy work. Uh, we provide uh, board development workshops and learning for individual board members. And then we, we help to coordinate relationships between our members and affiliated programs uh, that provide services to school districts and school boards. Okay. And then we also have Matt Carver. He is the Legal Services Director of the School Administrators of Iowa. Hello, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Trish. Appreciate the invitation. Sure. And if you want to explain your job a little bit and the uh, Administrators Association. Sure. So I, I've been the Legal Services Director at SAI for almost 18 years now. And so School Administrators of Iowa is the professional association for we have last year, we had just over 2,200 administrators. So that's, you know, I'd say probably close to 99% of the administrators in the state of Iowa are members of the association somewhere near there anyway. So a good portion. So I sometimes there's confusion in Iowa. We have a, you know, we have a, a union for teachers, of course, and then it's a professional association for administrators. So just to sort of clarify that point, but School Ministers of Iowa provides a great deal of professional learning for our members, uh, opportunities for them to meet and sort of collaborate on different things as far as ideas, things that they're doing in their buildings or in their districts that they think might be helpful. Uh, to others. And then also in, in my role, then it's it's sort of like a, I'll provide professional learning, but a lot of times it's a, a free advice line. So if they're a member of the association, the administrator, I don't represent the district, but the administrator may call and get legal advice that's just part of their uh, part of their membership. So that way they're not having the district then is not having to, you know, pay quite as much to contact their district uh, legal counsel which would be, you know, considerably more expensive. Now, having said that at times, so, you know, I'll say, well, I'd encourage you in this instance to involve the district council, but that's that's primarily my role in, in what our association does. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, anyway, so we're going to get started this morning. I think DT is going to start us out, kind of give us a little bit of background about uh, school safety planning, what has been done in the past, and then how we're how we've moved forward. Yeah, so I've been in public education since the early 90s and uh, been in Iowa my whole career, grew up, uh, born and raised in Iowa. And so what we have seen, uh, especially since the late 90s, early 2000s, is a lot more time and energy and resources flow towards school safety initiatives and uh, work. So you know, it used to be uh, you would have uh, school buildings that were pretty wide open. People could enter, come in through a vestibule go into maybe a common area uh, and then enter into an office. Uh, students you know, could come and go and um, maybe at uh, secondary campuses, high schools in particular with open campus, not a lot of cameras in place. Well, I would say really a, a watershed moment was uh, you know, the shootings at Columbine that started conversations around how do we provide a more secure learning environment for our students, staff members and visitors to buildings. 
And so what we have seen are plans that are in place for, for staff, uh, safety plans, and, and most of that information is kept confidential uh, so that any bad actors don't have all the intimate uh, details about how a, a district will respond to say an intruder, especially a, an intruder with a weapon. Uh, we have seen a lot of resources flow towards, I'll, I'll say hardening school buildings, uh, including secure front entries where you may not be able to get into a vestibule. You have to buzz a button and you're on camera uh, as a common intervention now, or even if you can get into a vestibule, uh, you have to go in through an office. You can't go immediately into a school building. Uh, things like uh, blank doors. So you can exit a door, but on the outside, there is no handle to try to open that up. Uh, a lot more cameras in place, uh, whether it's in parking lots or on the exterior buildings and the interior buildings uh, have uh, lockdown buttons where from a central location, you can press a button and all the exterior doors are on electric uh, systems, digital systems that can lock those, those exterior doors and then close interior fire doors. And of course, training for staff, a lot of training for staff in terms of what to do uh, to secure rooms, uh, how to potentially uh, remove yourself from a building uh, safely with students uh, and when to do that. Uh, so one of the trainings we went through as the former superintendent of Norwalk is called Alice training. So that is a specific training designed to uh, help staff members determine when they uh, shelter in place in a room or when they uh, would try to evacuate a space. Uh, a lot of school resource officers across the, the country that are now in schools uh, to help with school safety, uh, coordination with law enforcement. And so a lot of time and effort is spent in Iowa. We have some requirements around county uh, crisis response and emergency response plans. Uh, and so there is just a, a lot of work that's occurring at the local level, a lot of resources. And of course, the, the state, the, of course, the state has weighed in recently with some funding for school districts. So we went through safety audits. And if you went through those safety audits, you could qualify for up to $50,000 per student attendance center uh, to help with, and this varies by district, what the safety audit identified as a need within that building. And so it might be a secure front entrance. It might be uh, a ballard in front of doors so people couldn't drive through doors. Uh, it may be uh, uh, help with just creating a more robust safety plan, it might be radios. Uh, and so there are uh, high-end radios that uh, allow you to communicate quickly uh, and easily with law enforcement. Uh, video systems, uh, lockdown systems, like I mentioned earlier before. So it really depends on the district you're in, but uh, through bond issue work, sales tax dollars, uh, PEPL dollars, there are, is an increasing amount of money that is devoted towards safety plans. Uh, getting into uh, a situation where you may have uh, five gallon buckets with supplies that are uh, located in classrooms that provide materials uh, to help if you do have to go into a lockdown. That could include things like bottled water, stop the bleed kits, uh, toilet seats, so you can empty out that five gallon bucket and use that as a toilet if need be. Uh, materials to help lock down and secure doors, uh, and so and potentially other communication devices. So there, are, there are just a lot of a myriad of things that are going on right now uh, within that. Uh, another aspect is technology. So a lot of districts now have visitor and volunteer systems where if you come into a building, uh, you have to give your ID. It runs through a system and a background check is completed. And then um, through those systems, uh, there are apps on phones that can be used to do things like immediately alert uh, an office to lock down a building, uh, clear the halls, uh, severe weather alerts. And, and so there are systems that allow that. And then through those systems, oftentimes there uh, is a process you can set up. And so if you have to go through a lockdown situation uh, and maybe vacate a building and go to a different location, you can help with reunification processes with students and parents. And so there are online resources. And with those online resources, you can have all what we uh, oftentimes before would have hard copy documents and rooms about how to handle certain threat situations. Uh, may still have those, but now they're also digitized in a lot of these, these apps that staff members can put on their phones. Uh, and so 
uh, as a superintendent, I could get a, a, a notification if we had to do a clear of the halls, which was usually for a medical situation in, the, in our district. And uh, with that, I would get a notification on my phone immediately that say the high school was on a, a clear the hall situation because a student was having a medical emergency. And then we could uh, message back and forth uh, to see what uh, what resources need to be brought needed to be brought to bear uh, to help with that situation. So uh, a lot of what we see uh, is it has been have been good developments to help keep kids safe and. Uh, and it's an ongoing process that is modified based on what we're seeing in society and, and how schools have to respond. But it's definitely taking up more time and more energy and more resources for schools to address the, the current dynamics that we live with each and every day. And it's not just schools, right? It's, it is churches, it is businesses, it is other uh, you know, performance venues and things like that where they have some of the same concerns. Sure. Is there anything uh, new that has come out or anything recent that maybe some districts are using or anything like that? Any trends like that happening? I, I think most recently, it, later in my tenure, it was the online apps to, to help with communication, uh, Stop the Bleed kits, uh, and the, like Alice training, uh, specific training about how to uh, be intentional with staff and then uh, you can have student training as well. And so we had uh, some, some different types of trainings with students on how to respond, of course, led by staff members to, if there was an intruder in the building. Uh, and so we would go through drills. And so we've always had drills around uh, fire drills and tornado drills. Uh, what's been added recently is bus evacuation drills and, uh, and, and lockdown drills uh, for, for different reasons, right? Uh, and so uh, those have been some of the most recent developments. And then the safety money that's coming down from the state is that 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 audit process from a safety standpoint uh, and trying to bring some uniformity to that from a state level has been a new development as well. And again, that takes time and effort. And we appreciate the resources that are flowing towards schools to, to help with the safety and security measures that they're trying to implement. Sure. And then how often are those audits done? Uh, that has just been a one-time event oh. uh, that was required by the state to to um, qualify for the dollars. And okay. so with, with that, it's a one-time event. Now, on a different basis, there are some requirements of reviewing safety plans with school boards on an annual basis, uh, and that is a different process uh, than what the audit was. So there, there are other local items in place and systems in place to regular, regularly review your crisis response plans and safety plans. Okay, okay. Well, with, the, uh, with some of the schools eliminating uh, some of the school resource officers, how has that changed things? Have, have they uh, changed things in, in basically training some staff in you know, some taking in or filling in some of those gaps or how does that work? How does that work? Well, I can't speak for all those school districts. I would just say that there are sure. some requirements that schools go through that don't require the assistance of a local law enforcement agency or a school resource officer. And so they may still be passing some of that information through law enforcement because we know in these situations that 911 is going to be called and you are going to be working with local law enforcement. And so I can't speak for all the specifics. I can only speak to my experience, sure. but some of that work will occurs regardless of whether or not a school continues or discontinues or has never had a school resource officer program. Okay. Matt, can you kind of weigh in on some of this? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, and I thought D, D, DT did a great job, but just with really an overview of many of the things that have gone on. But I think one of the things that I've really appreciated, certainly have been fortunate to be involved in part of it is just the extent of collaboration we've had in the state here. So just for those Iowans who are on, you know, watching, listening to us right now, you know, we've had many meetings over the years, and this has really been ongoing from, you know, state agencies at, at time, we'll have individuals even from the federal level or federal law, you know, we've had meetings where even, you know, individuals from like the FBI have been involved in things like that in weighing in. Now, typically it's, it's more state and local where you'll have you know, law enforcement, you'll have fire, 
you all have the schools, you know, as, as DT mentioned, that, that sort of the emergency management side and all working together. And that's really what's best at the community level, because it varies. These plans, of course, vary depending on, you know, what what the infrastructure, you know, what the structures are like in each building. You know, our buildings are so different. You know, some of our mm-hmm. districts might have brand new buildings and they have some of the advantages of of new architecture and some of the things that DT mentioned. And of course we have many other buildings that, that aren't new. And so they have to factor that in as they're determining, all right, what's the best plan for that particular district, that particular building in, in working together and just having that communication. But that's what I would say in just the, the near, you know, nearly 18 years I've been involved, there's just far more, of that collaboration and ongoing communication now than there was 18 years ago. And and the other piece, unfortunately, this is sort of an unfortunately, unfortunately, we've of course had a lot of learnings from some of these uh, violent events that have occurred, not only in our state, but of course, outside of our state. And Mm -hmm. so some of the things that DT had, had mentioned are learnings from those events and what happened, those tragic events in in other areas that then we try to bring back here in Iowa, as far as how we, how we approach, you know, particular situations. I mean, one, I'll give an example is that, you know, many years ago, we might've used more like code language and so so forth to, to do certain things in the building. Well, depending on the particular event now, uh, it, they've decided many districts that, well, you know what, we just need to be specific of what they need to do right now. We don't want there to be any confusion mm-hmm. about what needs to happen if there is going to be that communication to the staff. So those are some just some examples of things that have been ongoing learnings, uh, you know, that have occurred over the years. You know, I, I, I would say uh, another thing that I've greatly appreciated is the the willingness of law enforcement in our communities to you know get involved and not complain about it and so forth when school officials have felt a need to contact law enforcement because most the reality is most of our buildings don't have an SRO. I mean most buildings in Iowa just uh, just the reality across the state. And so when they're calling that local police or they're calling that sheriff when they feel there's a need and one thing that I've always communicate is I've gotten calls from administrators is, you know, when in question, err on the side of safety. You know, if, if children don't feel safe, it's impossible for them to learn. And I, I think our educators do a pretty good, you know, do a pretty good job of that when in determining, you know what, this is something that worries me enough where, yes, I do feel I need to contact law enforcement. And again, we're very fortunate. And I, I can I could probably, you know, on one hand, list the number of times during my time here where I've had administrators say, oh, a, you know, a sheriff's deputy or an officer was upset that we contacted them uh, about something where we were concerned about safety. So, you know, those are some things, too, in that involvement. So we're bringing in, you know, some of their expertise as well. As far as the drills, uh, DT had mentioned those, you know, there was some legislation passed a number of years ago. Now, I'm confident schools were doing this anyway, but there is an annual requirement. He had mentioned boards reviewing annually. So there is an annual requirement in Iowa now to do those particular safety drills. So most Iowans you know, are aware of the tornado drills and fire drills and things like that. But there is a requirement at least, at least once annually to do a, a, a safety drill, a safety response drill. Now, the board has some flexibility in deciding what that looks like, because back to each district and building being different, some districts might decide, you know what, we want to do more of a tabletop exercise, involve key staff members or staff members, you know, local agencies and do that, while other districts might decide they want to involve the students even in those drills. And so that, that, but it just varies and there's not a one size fits all answer for what really the best drill is for any particular district. So I did want to mention that now uh, also just that, that requirement that is an Iowa code as well. Okay. And then on that, I mean, with the active, like the active shooter, you know, uh, drills that they, you know, some do, 
is that a is that something they do yearly or annually or does it just depend again on the on the school district yeah i would say that it it depends on what sometimes they'll they'll it, it might focus on an active shooter now one of the things with that as well is we really want to make sure that there's communication depending on uh you know how realistic so to speak that that is or what what's utilized to do that that there's there's communication with parents guardians about those and community members at times about those events occurring because there have been instances i, I don't believe in iowa but I, I know i've seen some outside of the state where they've had those types of trainings and then others in the community or uh, there maybe there's not great communication and then students are worried and, and texting parents or sending messages worrying that it's an actual event. So again, I think we've done a pretty good job in Iowa ensuring that doesn't happen. But to answer your question, not necessarily every year might they go over that, but it certainly is something that undoubtedly is talked about amongst the administration and other educators in the district, you know, no, no doubt. Okay. Can you, I mean, can you, either one of you guys explain like when they do an active shooter drill, kind of what, what they do through, through that process, just kind of in general terms, uh, just to, you know, to explain to people, if, if people are on here, maybe not familiar with that, or maybe parents are curious and, and do want to know. Yeah, I think it really, as Matt said, it really depends on the, the local district and, and their level of comfort and within their community. And I would, before I forget, I want to hit on Matt's uh, mention of collabor collaboration. So there's so much collaboration that happens between districts and between uh, so school district to school district and within areas to help share information. And then also with law enforcement agencies, this is a, a truly a collaborative effort to keep kids and staff members safe. So when it comes to active shooter drills, oftentimes that's just going to be professional law enforcement. I would say that's probably one of the most common types where they ask to have permission to use a facility and they come in and uh, they will use that facility to, to get familiar. So they want to do that training usually locally so that they know the, the terrain, the, the layout of the building, so on and so forth. And, uh, and then it's gone uh, upwards of having students be involved and staff uh, to the point of including other first responders and talking about a, someone who's severely injured uh, and needs uh, to be triaged and uh, evacuated immediately to a hospital. Uh, you can have you know, role playing and uh, you know fake uh, fake blood, if you will, and things like that. So you have some high end uh, type of situations that you you have the cooperation of local community, parents, students, staff members, etc. And so, but I would say the most common type of active shooter training is typically law enforcement, uh, possibly with a few staff members uh, that, that go through and train. And, and uh, try to, one reason to include staff members is oftentimes you'll have a staff member who's in the central location and uh, providing maybe a narrative over a PA system uh, to talk about um, you know, what is currently going on and, and watching through video cameras, et cetera, to, to help the people who are sweeping a building to determine where the threat actually is. And as I'll mention on that too, as, as uh, DT was saying, Trish, um, with those drills, those ones that are really most realistic, the educators obviously consider, okay, is this gonna potentially create trauma? Just the act, just the event, this is training for students. And so that's why they're very cautious about doing the ones that are really most realistic, as DT mentioned, if you're gonna have simulated casualties. And I, I happen to be retired from the Iowa National Guard too, so I've had the benefit of going through similar type of training and a long military career. But to really make that uh, the best possible training for first responders, they're probably gonna to wanna to make that more realistic, but that realism can potentially be a, a trauma for, for a student. And so that's why they'll typically, if they want to get that real and go through. And so the law enforcement, for instance, as they're clearing rooms, I mean, there's processes because you don't want to have friendly fire, so to speak, if there's a need to discharge their weapon in an actual event. And so they'd go through probably either with blanks or a, a dummy weapon, 
you know, they're certainly not going to have line, live rounds in their weapons at that point as they're doing that type of training just for safety purposes. But they'd want to have something out because if they're if they're going in with a, a rifle or something, you know, clearance around doors and corners and all those things. And so they benefit from that. But obviously, if you had students in there seeing all this, you know, it really could be a trauma. So they typically will stay away from anything that real with students there involved. Okay. And then, uh, I mean, let's talk a little bit about, or can you talk a little bit about the, uh, like now the challenge is the social media threats. Like, you know, that wasn't, that, you know, didn't exist, you know, several years ago, but now that's that's really become the forefront. I mean, how how do you think, has that, has that been, uh, I guess I, it's got to be more challenging for everybody. Well, it, with almost every student and staff member having a communication device in their pocket every day, right. it's, it can be a, increase the challenges that school districts are going through in terms of what level of communication is expected. And so I'll give a personal example. We, we were uh, working on the middle school in Norwalk and a contractor disconnected a, a door from the system. Well, the software didn't like that a whole lot. And so it created a uh, lockdown oh. situation uh, in the building. So nothing was going on. There was, there was no intruder, but it locked down the building and both of our offices. So we had two offices that have the ability uh, at that time to, to do a lockdown. And so of course we were notified at the district office and um, in, and so the building went down to lockdown. And uh, so we didn't know what was necessarily going on. And so we, we followed our protocols. We got on videos. But the way I found out was my, my, one of my children was a student at the time at the high school. And so they texted me and said, Dad, what's going on? And that was before the system actually kicked in. The, the system worked exactly like it was supposed to. I got the notification within the timeline I was supposed to notify. But it was like within seconds, my my child was letting me know this. And so that was a, a learning experience for all of us. And so within about 20 minutes, I had made 22 phone calls. Uh, I think it was about 30 text messages. And um, we were able to get some communication out to parents because we had parents showing up uh, at our buildings trying to get their kids out. And of course we're in lockdown. And so that communication really presents a new challenge, the ability to uh, communicate presents a challenge. And there were false narratives that were out there. There was an active intruder, uh, you know, and so, and we had, we have to monitor all of that after the fact and determine, did someone say something they shouldn't have, staff or student, which is, you know, we call it an after action review. And uh, we had to go through that, but uh, it was a narrative of how quickly do you need to communicate with your communities and your parents specifically about what's going on? Because the, I would say the expectation now is, we want communication sooner rather than later, but you don't want to share uh, incorrect information too soon. Yeah. And so our priority as a district was we had uh, a, our school resource officer at the time, along with other officers that were sweeping the building. And we, we were fairly confident that nothing was going on, but we had to be sure. And so that took us probably 10 to 15 minutes. And like I said, within 20 minutes, we used our, our school messaging system to send out basically an all clear to our parents. And, and we had, you know, a few parents that were critical of us and said, you weren't fast enough with that. And, and so it's this, it's just the reality of, again, the society we're in and how easy it is to communicate point to point, person to person, it creates certain dynamics. Because our, our first concern is not to communicate with the outside world, uh, aside from law enforcement and other people we need to. It is to ascertain what the threat level is, make sure that students and staff and visitors to our building are safe and then uh, resolve the, the situation, yes, as quickly as possible. Uh, some folks want that within a minute or two or five minutes, uh, but the reality is usually that's not gonna happen that quickly. And, and so the, the communication uh, from point to point, it used to be, you know, people didn't have cell phones. And so uh, individual uh, authorities within a school district or law enforcement could control that narrative a little bit more and that flow of information now it's more about how do you manage information and the flow of information during the fact or after the fact and try to get accurate information out as quickly as possible to, to calm 
the, the waters and to provide accurate information and cut down on the rumors and the misinformation that can quickly find itself out in the public sphere. Because then we had uh, folks that were outside of our community, siblings that were contacting parents back in our community. And this is again within 10, 15, 20 minutes of, hey, what's going on at the high school? And then of course, social media posts and things like that. Yeah. And so you try to get accurate information out there as quickly as possible, but that, that creates another layer of challenge uh, for our organizations because you may have a false piece of, like in that situation, we had a false piece <laughs> of information that we had to clarify later and say, this is not, it's not accurate and that's not what's going on. Yeah, I can imagine that would be. I I I don't know what happened with the with the Cedar Rapids situation when they had the social media threat, but I mean, obviously they took it serious enough where they did close the school for a day, and so it's you know something like that. I'm assuming that's like they had a they had enough information where they thought you know it could be valid or valid, or maybe they did it just because you know for safety of of everybody just in case. I would I would think they'd err on the side of caution. Yeah, we, we, my, my middle child went through that in a, we, we lived in a different district at the time, but they, the high school had to evacuate based on a social media threat that was deemed, that was deemed the possibility of uh, a credible situation. Uh, and so went through that situation with another child in a different district. Uh, and so we have to remember that we have so many people that are working in schools that their own children are, are going to school. And so there is a great level of motivation for school administrators, staff members to keep uh, certainly uh, all kids safe and their own kids safe. And so it is the, the reality that educators live on a day-to-day -day basis right now. Yeah, that, yeah it's, not, it's not like they have enough to do, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I, I just add to that, uh, Trish, that some of the districts now will have uh, software monitoring and so that now that doesn't isn't going to pick up all the things that students are doing on their own technology on on social media, but it does pick up things that are done maybe through their assignments are done on the school's computer or if they're connected through the the school's internet and so forth that it'll actually pick up it'll, there'll be there's there are algorithms that pick up certain words or things or if they're concerns whether it's about safety or concerns of self-harm or a variety of other things. And then they'll alert administrators, there'll actually be messages, and then they have to figure out. Now there are times when it's just picking up words and they, they'll they look into it and there's, there's really nothing there. Uh, but I just wanted to mention, there is that technology that you know, will hopefully continue to improve as far as you know, developments in that area that, that are helpful to, to, to many districts out there. And then also, I just mentioned for those that are on here, you know, the the sort of the see something, say something, as far as students. And you know, DT mentioned students, and and I would say a majority of the time when school officials are made aware of threats on social media or activity outside of school of some sort, it's coming from students. You know, occasionally it'll come from parents too, and that's great, or guardians. But typically, it'll come from students who see something and they that troubles them, and they mention that. So I, I would encourage parents, guardians on here, or grandparents, whoever else might be might be listening, to have conversations with with their students about that, about making sure that they feel comfortable to you know share it with with the the principal, share it with the parent or guardian, let them know. Uh, because again, we'd rather err on the side of caution and help to look into those things. Now, often if it is something on social media, and, and I'll, I will mention too, there are questions that come in as far as free speech. Well, is this when is something free speech? What's mentioned? And you know, typically when you get into the area of threats, that is not protected speech. And so we have good case law on that. That. Uh, from the United States Supreme Court that that would not and in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals and Iowa was part of that Eighth Circuit that those those threats uh, are not protected speech so, so the school may get involved in those situations potentially on the discipline side and then certainly if that's happening outside of school depending on the extent of the threat it, they'll often involve local law enforcement to look into it because law enforcement of course can go to the home 
can look in they, if they need to for safety purposes, potentially go go inside potentially if, if they have probable cause to do so for for the safety of the children or others to see if there's you know the extent of the credibility of the threat is is incredibly important to try to get a grasp on okay how credible is this threat here? Sure. Yeah, it bears repeating that we when you see something when you hear something say something whether it's a community member a parent or a student uh, that has solved so many issues that could have been a much larger problem. Uh, and so that uh, all those eyes and ears that are out in the community and school buildings, it's really important uh, to, to, you know, we can't rely on technology for everything. Sometimes it is just good old fashioned. I, I overheard something and I reported it to the appropriate people so that they could prevent something from happening. Yeah. And Matt, I was going to ask you, you can uh, kind of expand on the legal implications of things like when they do, like when they are investigating, you know, like, like at Cedar Rapids, they had that 14 year old, uh, when they go in and they start, you know, like searches when searches are involved and seizures and things like that. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, so in, in schools, when the, when the school is leading a search, so let's say you have a, uh, a student that comes to talks to the teacher or the principal and thinks that a student has a, a knife, let's just say, or something like that, then the standard is what's called reasonable suspicion. So they have reasonable grounds to suspect that a student has something on in their possession or in their locker or, or bag or something like that, a vehicle potentially, that they, they have that thing and whatever they possess is in violation of school policy or Iowa law. So it's a fairly low standard, okay, reasonable grounds to suspect. So when I talk to administrators about it, I say, well, does this, does this individual, this witness or whoever it is, do they appear to be credible with the information that they're sharing, okay? And so if they are, if they say, yeah, they, they do appear to be credible, this is concerning, that, you know, that's, that's likely going to be enough then to meet that. Now, law enforcement, if law enforcement is leading a search, then they need to have probable cause. So that's a little bit higher standard. Now, if the school requests law enforcement to, so let's say you had a principal, the principal initiates it, but wants some assistance from the SRO. Let's say they do have an SRO in their building because that SRO it probably has some more training on the best techniques as far as doing searches and such, then it would still be off of that reasonable suspicion standard uh, due to the fact that it was the school initiating that. And then if they happen to find something, then there are some triggers, just so those on here know, that in Iowa law, if school officials happen to find a dangerous weapon, and they have definitions of a dangerous firearm, of course, is a dangerous weapon, a uh, spring, uh, like a switchblade or something, a spring projected, a knife is a dangerous weapon. If a knife's over five inches in length, that's considered a dangerous weapon. And so if it's a dangerous weapon, there's a requirement under Iowa law to notify law enforcement. So let's say you didn't have an SRO in the building. Uh, you, they do a search. They find a knife. It is over five inches. Well, then th they don't even have a choice. I mean, they they're required by Iowa law then to contact law enforcement in that instance. Uh, now, if it happened to be smaller than that, they might still decide to contact law, law enforcement. They may, but they wouldn't be required to do so. And then as you get into searches, too, the policies will differ a bit from, uh, you know, from district to district. And as DT mentioned up front, his organization does a great job of putting together policies that are used, gen you know, across the state of Iowa. Uh, Iowa Association of School Boards develops the policies that are used by a vast majority, almost all the districts. And so, but some of those policies in different districts are sort of tweaked a little bit uh, as far as what needs to be done when some of those searches occur. But typically, you'd expect that at some point there's, you know, there's obviously going to be a, a communication to the parent or guardian. Hey, we're maybe we're searching your student, or we did search the student and we found we found something here. And that communication now is there. There are times when there are questions about well, when is a requirement for the school officials to contact uh, parents or guardians when law enforcement is involved? 
the the legal requirement in Iowa is if the student is in custody by law enforcement. Now, many districts, so think of being in custody of students brought into a, a, a an office or something and they want to, they decide, you know what, I, I don't want to be in here any longer and they're wanting to leave and the law enforcement officer does not permit them to leave. Well, I, I would say, generally speaking, they'd be considered to be in custody in situations like that where they're they're not allowing them to leave at that point. So then there's a requirement to contact or to attempt to contact parents or guardians under Iowa law. Now, having said that, many districts will have some form of communication uh, before that that time, before a student is is ever in custody. It's it's pretty it's fairly typical where there'll be some communication there. Okay. And so, yeah, because there's different laws for juveniles compared to like an adult, you know, mm -hmm. that obviously in a situation. So, right. That's, that's right. Okay. Anything else on that, uh, along with the, along the lines of legal implications for schools, anything else? Yeah. Is, as far as the searches or the weapons or just, yeah. Or anything like during the, you know, when they do one of these kind of investigations like that. Yeah. Yeah. Else? Good question. So, so another thing that'll come up at times, and, and those on here might be interested in this, is, is that, you know, educators, administrators realize the, the students are in school, you know, they're in school to learn. I mean, that's why they're there. Well, at times, I wanted that I'll just be open about this, that there are, there are times when maybe law enforcement will come to the school and say, hey, well, we want to we want to question this student during the school day. OK, maybe about something that happened outside of school. All right. Now, they the, the school officials may they may allow them to do that. But often you know, when they when I'll get those calls, I'll say, hey, you may, but you're not you're not required to in that instance. OK, if they don't, you know, typically when they're just coming to question because. Uh, it's just easier, of course, they know, well, there's a decent likelihood that minor or that student's going to be at the school at that time. But I think often administrators, they, 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 they'll they try to protect that somewhat. If it's not something really related to the school, they'll try to protect that time uh, as, as best as they can. So say, well, it would really be better for us that you do this maybe after school or th that uh, those questions occur at that time instead of pulling a student out of class. Now, again, I'm not, it's not a violation if they did, but that is something that practically will, will come up on occasion as far as involvement of law enforcement of the school when maybe it wasn't initiated by the school. And I, I should mention too on the, on the uh, social media, the other thing that I'd, as far as threats or just different behavior on there, you know, I would really encourage parents beyond parents and guardians beyond the, the see something, say something is if students are seeing there's another student that just isn't, you know, just isn't putting positive things out there. Well, you know, well, educators will will do our best to right, I shouldn't say we I'm sorry, I've been around long enough. But I'm not technically an educator. I apologize, DT. But but to say, hey, you know, you don't need to don't follow that student anymore. And I'm not necessarily talking about threats, but just someone who's putting a lot of things out there, whether it might be sort of bullying type of behavior or other things that just aren't positive things are putting out there. You know, try to encourage those students. And again, hopefully others here will encourage their, their child. Just, you know what, don't follow that student any longer. Uh, you know, un unfriend them on that social media or just don't follow them or, or whatever. Uh, is don't don't encourage that because sometimes what'll happen is some of those students that are putting the most salacious things out there. Well, if other students then oh they want to go and and see this, you know it's sort of like going and seeing a, a you know a train wreck or whatever, and it's like oh it gets all this attention. Well, then it, all it does is just encourage in some way, even if they're not actively involved in that, it, it's an encouragement to that student who's putting all these unhealthy things out there on social media. So that's just something else to consider, again, whether it's related to safety or, or otherwise. Sure, because I think a lot of times when those things are put out like that, maybe they could be stopped at that point. You know, if people, you know, I, I mean, not always. I'm not saying that always, right. but I, I just feel like sometimes it can be if it's especially if it's something, you know, really over something really silly. 
Yeah. But sometimes those, you know, more uh, serious incidents turn out of things that are just really, you know, silly, like somebody disrespecting someone or, you know, just, just That's you know, right. other, you know, less, you know, things that, things that wouldn't, you wouldn't think that would be a big deal, but of course it is to, to a younger person. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And that's what and I mentioned, the the bullying. And obviously, we haven't talked too much of that, but that can tie into sure. a lot of this at times. I mean, how many times yeah. do we hear about stories where bullying, and that doesn't justify anything, it doesn't excuse anything, but there is there is something there and just not participating in that type of behavior. Yeah, definitely. Anything else, DT, that you can... From, from a policy standpoint, it's it's really important for districts and other organizations to be proactive in, in terms of how are we going to figure out what to do with a student who is making bad choices on social media or makes a threat. Trying to make up things as you go is, is not what we would uh, provide counsel about at IASB. And I know SAI uh, would be in a similar vein of how are you proactive? So having a bullying and harassment policy and investigation process, and you know that part of that's required by state law. But sure. you know, if a student makes a threat, what is your process that you're going to go through to ascertain? You know, the is that a, a, a threat that's legitimate uh, or not? And so, uh, like in my previous district, we had a process that if a student made a particular threat for loss of life or <clears throat> physical harm, that we would go through. We may involve law enforcement. We may involve licensed mental health professionals. Uh, there may be a consequence, uh, suspension, possibly up to expulsion. So there was a process that we went through when that uh, a threat was made. And so, uh, of course, at ISB, we have some policies and we can provide some assistance along that. But it might be handbook language, student handbook language as well. Uh, but being proactive and thinking about those situations before they occur in local school districts is uh, a key item. So that, again, you're not trying to make this up as you go through that process. Okay. And, and I'll add on to that. And that's a, thanks for mentioning that DT. So with those processes, one, those are just sort of helpful reminders. So they're not missing a step because a lot of times, especially as we're talking about things like this relating to, to safety, you know, adrenaline can sort of get going at times for some staff members too, as they're, as they're going through these. So when they have those processes in place, then they make sure to sort of go down, okay, have we done this? Have we done this? Have And then the other piece of that that's very important to follow some sort of process is making sure that, that school officials are being consistent with the application of their policies and the rules. And so that's because what you don't want to do too is, you know, they don't want to, if they don't have processes in place, then they might, whether it's intentional or unintentional, well now they start treating different students differently, perhaps based off of past behavior. And does past behavior make a difference? Might that be something that's considered? Yes, but you wanna consider that within the process. You wanna consider it within the process. And so that's one of the things that's so important because you know school officials definitely want to the best of their ability to be consistent with the application of the rules and their policies. Sure. Well, anything else, guys? We've got a few more minutes, but yeah, yeah, Trish. I, there, there is one thing that I wanted to mention that's probably a little bit confusing for a lot of people, and that relates to uh, federal law, and then it's also in state law regarding students with with disabilities. And so there's some additional protections are there. So it can be a bit confusing at times as far as what the school, and of course the school keeps uh, student discipline confidential. The school's not gonna come out and say, well, we did this to this student, gave this level of suspension or detention or whatever it is. But beyond that, there, there are some restrictions there for students that with students with disabilities, the process is just a little bit different as far as what school officials need to do and what they're able to do. And so, and what I mean by that is, for instance, if a student has a disability, then let's just say it's a student who's had, you know, significant issues and has done something that really requires a, a good deal of discipline, then they have up to 10 school days of suspension during the year. But then if it's going to be cumulative, 
go beyond that, then they need to have what's called a manifestation determination meeting. And during that, they, they determine whether or not whatever the behavior was, was a manifestation of the student's disability. Okay, so now let's say that they determine it's not a manifestation. Well, then if it's not a manifestation, then there is some potential that there might be discipline beyond that. And the school board's likely going to be involved if it's going beyond 10 days because uh, they, they need to be, frankly, if it's beyond 10 days. But then the school still needs to provide instruction to those students. So that's something that's different than uh, if a student does not have a disability, then that, can, that instruction is not continuing at that point, potentially, potentially. Now, the, of course, schools sometimes work and they do online instruction of some sort or whatever. But I just want to mention that because sometimes it's, it's confusing, uh, you know, and then they don't understand, well, what, what is the school doing here? Because the reality is, as far as uh, keeping things confidential, well, individuals still notice if a student is, let's say, in a building or not in a building and so forth. So I just wanted to mention that because it's something that I think a lot of individuals just are unaware of as far as some of those uh, federal requirements. Sure. And I think a key aspect from a, you know, just a practical standpoint, what Matt mentions is even if you do have a student with who uh, has uh, an IEP uh, and you go through a manifestation hearing, even if it is a manifestation of their disability, it doesn't mean that the education program has to remain the same. Uh, and so I think there are some, there's some notions out there with parents and sometimes staff members that, you know, if a student is a legitimate threat, you, you may be able to look at a different type of educational program or placement for them uh, out of consideration for the, the safety of others. Uh, and so it, uh, there are a lot of different options that you can consider uh, for students that do have uh, disabilities and it manifests itself sometimes through threats or other behavior that uh, puts others at risk. Sure. And I guess I was just going to mention too, I know that's got, it's got to be frustrating. Well, probably for everybody, but for parents, I think too, is when these things happen and then, you know, the schools don't give much information and, you know, most of the time it's, it's for safety or, you know, confidentiality reasons. And so what would you guys, I guess, kind of say to, to those parents or kind of to explain what, what is kind of happening and why you can't? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, the, the, the district is, again, under federal law uh, with Family Educational Rights Privacy Act, which is, educators know as, a, as FERPA. You'll hear them talk about that. Maybe some parents or guardians have heard them use that term even, perhaps. But those, uh, you know, many of those things are going to be confidential and they're not able to share. Now, having as far as again the dis things relating to educational records which would include discipline of other students and okay. so that's why there are times when a parent or a guardian or someone might contact school and they might mention a lot of things that the administrator is saying okay well they yeah that's true that's true that's true but they're not going to be able to confirm those things they're they're just not going to be able to say that so or in instances where they are aware that, okay, yeah, maybe the student made the complaint or the family made the complaint or the, the family's own student was involved. So you know that they have some awareness. Well, yes. And we can just assure you that, you know, we took all these different steps and they can share what steps were taken as far as involving other agencies and to, to ensure that this was not a credible threat, let's say. Uh, and we've taken every step to ensure, you know, students in our, our district, not only your student, but other students or, and staff members are safe. And they're just, they have to do their best to try to give those assurances and that appropriate discipline was applied if, if, mm -hmm. if that's the case. But it's going to be very general at that level. So the Iowans just need to know it's not because they're, you know, the only reason they're hiding something is they're required to by law. You know, that's mm -hmm. not something they're just not able to share that. now. Having said that, there was a change in federal law after the Virginia Tech shootings many years ago. I think it was, I don't know, around 2007, where at Virginia Tech, they had some school officials that had some awareness of issues with the student, but didn't share something because they were so concerned about breaching confidentiality. And so there are some instances now when there is an articulable threat of substantial harm 
that school officials may share details regarding that if, it, if it's necessary to share that to protect others from that threat. So now that doesn't include sharing what discipline was given, but we're talking more so at, at something that's an ongoing threat, then they are able to share something that would otherwise be confidential, potentially even the identity of the student. So if you had a student that was out in the community that left that said, well, I'm gonna do something and they're searching for the student, I mean, they may share the name, you know, the photo, whatever is necessary so that others are aware that the student is out there and made this credible threat. And there's a, there's a concern that, that would call for them to share that type of detail. Yeah, okay. Anything else, last words, guys? Anything that we didn't talk I, about or would be helpful? I would helpful? just say thank, thank you, Trish, for helping to raise awareness around this issue in our state. It is an ongoing fluid dynamic situation that requires, again, a lot of time, a lot of planning, a lot of effort, a lot of resources that we didn't used to have to perform within schools uh, and other public entities, other private entities. And so anything that is done to try to help reduce the burden, uh, specifically, we're looking at it today from a school standpoint, we appreciate that. And so raising awareness is, is definitely appreciated from our organization. And uh, I just want to thank you for, for inviting me to be a part of this today. Great. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate you guys joining us and participating in the, in the conference. I think it's been really helpful and I, uh, I appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then also for those, and I agree with DT's comments, thanks to the Gazette and Nutrition. And then also for those who are on here and shown interest in this topic, you know, just continue to be active in your communities, you know, continue to have those conversations with your students if you have a student and to communicate with your, with your districts. So we, we appreciate your interest.